So welcome everyone to our 24th um, Data on Kubernetes community meetup. As always, very, very excited to be here. My name is Bart Farrell. I'll be hosting this meetup. As you can see, I have one of our wonderful t-shirts on. Speaking of that, I need to get Miguel and Jose's addresses so I can send you our t-shirts. Today we are Good. also, our, because today also, uh, happy new year to everyone. We will now have stickers. So I will be able to send you stickers as well. Um, so anyway, our community has existed for people that are joining um, since last year in July. We've had meetups since then. This is the first meetup that we're doing at this time in order to be able to incorporate folks who are, uh, who are living in, in Asia, particularly in India, at a time that uh, would work better for them than our regular meetup times, which are normally at 6 p.m. Uh, Central European time. So um, with that being said, two very, very interesting people who we have here today that are both from the same city and are currently living in different parts of the world and have also lived in other parts of the world, uh, which is quite curious. Uh, interestingly enough, we also share the fact that we all speak Spanish. I'm living in the north of Spain, in Bilbao. Um, and Jose, where are you right now? Just to double check. I'm, I'm actually trapped in Malaga because You're of this uh, beautiful <laughs> snowstorm that we had in Madrid. Okay. I'm uh, normally based in, in Madrid. <laughs> okay, so normally based in Madrid, going home for the holidays, kind of stuck there for right now. <laughs> and then Miguel, can you tell us where you are? Yeah, I'm, I'm in Berlin. I came back two days ago from beautiful Malaga. And now, well, I'm not going to say I'm trapped, but yes, I'm, I'm going to stay here for a long time. <laughs> okay, so trapped by choice. So with that yes. in mind, interestingly enough, when I started getting involved in, in the community and started contacting different people, I think it was through LinkedIn, or I'm not exactly sure how, because I think uh, Miguel Fontanilla is in the crowd as well too, and he, he kind of got me situated. Uh, I was immediately informed that there was a group of people that were working on a book about best practices in, in Kubernetes. And obviously, as it's something that's constantly evolving, and a lot of what we talk about is there's the technical aspect, and then also the aspect in terms of mindset or mentality or the cultural approach inside different companies, um, I think these kinds of best practices are extremely useful. Miguel and I were talking earlier about all the people, all the folks out there who are trying to get uh, certified as, as you know Kubernetes certified Kubernetes administrators, developers, or in the security aspect, which Miguel himself did. Um, so anyway, with, with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to both of you. Um, Miguel, if you want to share your, your presentation, you just want to yeah. introduce yourselves, how, you, how the two of you met each other, and then we can just take it from there. Also, of course, I always want to remind our audience members, you can feel free to follow us on Slack, uh, doc community. Also, um, you can also check us out on Twitter. If you have any questions, just put them in the chat right here. We'd be happy to answer them as we go along. All right, Miguel, it's all yours. All right, so I'm going to share my screen so you all can follow me and also uh, Jose. So right. Jose, I'm going to let you. I'm going to let you introduce uh, yourself first and also the topic of today. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, okay. So first of all, um, thanks, Bart, for for this opportunity. Uh, to present here to your uh, community um, is, is great. It's a great opportunity for us um, to share a um, few things. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm going to share um, an initiative and uh, a project uh, that we have uh, between a smaller community. And, and then uh, Miguel Angel is going gonna, is gonna to share um, best practice, an example of what we are building about this, this project. Um, first of all, so I'm, I'm, I'm Spanish, um, uh, I'm based in, in Madrid, and um, I'm myself uh, also technical, I have a technical background, and my role is um, solutions architect or um, um, sales engineer, you can call it. So basically, um, my role is to talk to multiple um, companies uh, technical people, the like of um, developers, um, testers, um, DevOps engineers, and mainly, you know, identifying different challenges that they are having and trying to help with multiple solutions. That is the um, uh, the core of my of my role of my job. That um, in the last few years, I've been talking to a lot of uh, people. Um, and technical gurus that are, you know, having experiences and, and good and bad with um, with Kubernetes, and a lot of them, um, they had actually 
bad experiences uh, when it comes to um, running applications in Kubernetes and specifically to uh, performance of those applications running in Kubernetes. Um, and that it was, you know, one of the things um, I have, I, were, I was doing and spending a lot of time analyzing different um, areas and components of uh, both Kubernetes clusters and, and applications to understand who was the culprit or what was the, the, the bottleneck or the root cause, right? Um, ultimately, we wanted to identify why the application, that application was not performing well or somehow misbehaving, right? Now, um, where I'm going with this is that what I, my conclusion was that um, a lot of these companies or um, technical uh, experts uh, were having troubles to get Kubernetes under control. Um, and ultimately, they were being even forced to ditch uh, Kubernetes or move to other um, orchestration tools, solutions like um, OpenShift or enterprise grade tools that, um, you know, by uh, paying or as a service, they could get some, some support. And uh, after all these conversations, I, you know, had, um, I had a moment where I thought, okay, we should be doing something more apart from, you know, um, selling software tools um, and services. I think that there was um, a bit more um, about the community and about um, sharing experiences. And that, that was the, the, the main um, driver, right, for starting a new project. And um, I started looking uh, for multiple, you know, experts on this, um, on this um, field. And I uh, started, you know, connecting with uh, Miguel Fontanilla, with Miguel Angel, uh, Javier, Rodrigo, other people uh, that are building this small community and which is, uh, which main objective is to share good and bad um, experiences, but also best practices um, when it comes to uh, using Kubernetes in production environments. Now, uh, I spent quite some time looking for these gurus, these experts. It wasn't easy because um, there are not that many. And um, the ones that are out there, they are pretty busy. So it is generally quite um, a rare, sc scarce resource out there. And um, I'm still obviously uh, looking for some of them. I'm you know, trying to, to connect with multiple um, um, communities, multiple, um, you know, uh, platforms where uh, these uh, experts are active. And uh, obviously, we are always um, keen to connect and speak to um, people that are on one side, they uh, must be um, knowledgeable on running Kubernetes and running applications on Kubernetes, but also that are very willing to um, to, to, to evangelize, to uh, share experiences uh, with the rest of the community. Um, so that is why we are here. Um, we would like to obviously share with, with all of you um, one specific uh, best practice from Miguel Ángel, who is a, a very good um, expert and very good uh, technician um, on the Kubernetes area. And uh, yeah, and with that, uh, with, without further ado, I would like to um, hand over to, to Miguel Angel. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Jose, for telling us about all the reasons why we started this project. And actually, you started it, and you kindly asked me to join it, and I was very glad about that. I was very happy to join. I think it's a great opportunity for everyone out there in the community to learn and share some experiences and try to have a good time with Kubernetes and not to fail at the first trial, right? All right, so about myself, as um, Jose has said, I'm a system engineer at Deliver Hero. I've been working with Kubernetes for the last three years. I'm also Kubernetes administrator certified, and I've been doing a lot of things in Kubernetes uh, during these uh, three years as my company has grew up a lot into our business. 
and our core in the end it's on the tech stack it's kubernetes so one of the things i'm going to show today um I, I forgot to change to this slide to present myself one of the things i'm going to show today that is about is going to be available in the book that we are we are writing together is overscaling a kubernetes cluster so what I want to share in this case is there is it's very, uh, very common to find platforms that are not going to have the same amount of traffic all of the time during the day, right? I, for example, work in a company where our platform is going to have different amount of traffic based on the uh, main times of meal during the day, like breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And of course, there are going to be all the times during the day where the traffic is going to be way lower and of course, we always want to be uh, available for our customers and reliable, but also cost effective with our infrastructure, right? We want to take both uh, best of both things and offer a great product to everyone and also to ourselves. So in this case, uh, we, have, uh, we are using since the beginning an add-on for Kubernetes called the Cluster Autoscaler that will uh, change the number of nodes running the cluster based on utilization. So the more amount of replicas we need to run for our applications, the more amount of nodes that cluster with the scalar will in charge to add into the cluster. And in the same way, when the traffic is lower and our applications are having less amount of replicas being managed by uh, themselves with horizontal pod out of scalar, we, we don't do anything by hand. Um, of course, cluster, cluster the scale is going to realize of, of, of that as well, and it's going to reduce the number of, of nodes in the cluster. So we always have running the capacity that we need to serve our, our customers around the world. When we have this kind of dynamically sized Kubernetes cluster, there is usually a few challenges that I'm going to explain right now. First of all, uh, we are not going to pay attention to how many nodes we are going to be running. Of course, we are going to set some kind of threshold to make sure that nothing is going out of control and we have an ex kind of expected amount of nodes per the amount of traffic that we are serving. But we don't care if we are running 10, 20, 50, 100 nodes at a time. For us, the main idea is that the applications will uh, require more or less computing resources, is going to have more or less pods running in a particular time of the day, and the cluster will resize itself to provide um, exactly the amount of CPU and, oh, well, basically computing resources that the cluster need, right? And this, it can lead to another issue where uh, where applications suddenly start to receive a lot of traffic at the same time because multiple customers around the world start to get hungry and they want to order food, for example, at Deliver Hero, which is our main core business. And our applications are gonna need to scale up. They're gonna need to create more replicas. And it might happen that at some point, we are not gonna have enough computing capacity and cluster to scalar will then detect it and create new nodes. But uh, depending on our solution, sometimes on-premise solution or cloud providers can take a lot of time to provision a new machine for the cluster. For example, on-premises, sometimes we require to have new hardware, we require to set it up and then join in the cluster, or in a cloud provider, maybe a new virtual machine can take up to five minutes for it to get ready and join the cluster as well. And during these five minutes, we our new pods are gonna be impending and they're not going to do anything. They're not going to be. They are not going to be created, and they're not going to be able to serve any traffic. And of course, that can lead to the issue where our traffic is actually bigger than the amount of capacity we or the amount of traffic we can serve, and our current available replicas are going to start failing. And it might be the case that it doesn't create a big issue on the platform but definitely is going to impact the customer experience because it might be the case that a user cannot be able, is not able to place an order or might be the case that a user has to refresh a page. And that is definitely something we don't want our customers to, to, to see, right? And to deal with. So then at some point, the virtual machine is created, we have a new node, then the pods get created, get created and we still uh, serving traffic as, as it grows, right? 
So this was an issue for us at Deliver Hero, and we had to tackle it. We had to solve this problem because um, for us, Kubernetes is the major investment and we want something reliable and something that can be uh, all of the time performing correctly for all of our users. With that, um, we started investigating on how um, Kubernetes schedules new pods and how Cluster Autoscaler that creates new nodes out of those pending pods. And then we found out uh, the way that a scheduler takes into consideration whether a pod is um, able to be allocated or not into a node is using the pods resource allocation. When you are uh, allocated, creating a pod or a deployment, you will allocate some a certain amount of CPU and memory. And this is what scheduler is gonna take into consideration to understand if a pod can fit into a node or not. And when a pod is not able to be created in any of the available nodes, then a scheduler will uh, mark it as unscheduled and cluster autoscaler will then trigger the, a new node based on that. All right, once we understood how this works, we decided, we decided to create a solution, something that could work out of the box for us. And with that, we came up with the idea of a dummy deployment. A dummy deployment meaning that we'll run an application, a container, doing nothing, just basically a couple of Golang code, uh, co um, Golang lines of code to just run an application that will always be sleeping. It will never consume CPU, will never consume memory. But as we are in setting resources, then request CPU and memory in the deployment, they will allocate some space into the node and the scheduler will take that um, amount of CPU and memory into consideration whenever a new pod has to be scheduled. So with that, um, we could reserve that space. And again, we actually found out there was a new functionality in Kubernetes called um, preemption and pod priority that we could take advantage of. Because the idea is our dummy pod is gonna be running a very low pod priority, which means that the importance of the pod into the cluster is very minimum, like nothing. And on the other hand, all our pods for any of the applications are gonna have a higher pod priority, which means they will always have um, um, the priority to be created at any point in the cluster. Using this with preemption, whenever a new pod of our application is created, these dummy pods that have a lower priority will be evicted. And that space that these dummy pods were occupying will be taken by the new pod by the new application pod immediately happening. So with that time, we don't need to wait for a new node to join the cluster or to be created because at that time, our application will already be created and it will take that space. And the evicted dummy pod is gonna cause a cluster of the scalar to trigger a new node. And by that time, we will have saved some time, some, some requests to be still able to um, be processed. And once it joined, the new node has joined the cluster. Again, the dummy pod is allocated, created, and we've got a new node ready for, for new pods of our application. A graphical view is this. Uh, generally, the dummy pod is gonna have a higher, uh, bigger size than the rest of our applications. So the idea is that maybe one dummy pod can have the size of three, four or five pods of our application. So anytime that our traffic grows grows massively or unexpectedly, uh, there will still be enough room for multiple pods to be created at once. And that's exactly what we see on the picture here on the left top corner. Then once our application grows and scales the number of replicas, as we see in this bottom left uh, picture, the application is gonna take the space of the dummy pod and the dummy pod is gonna go into pending. And immediately, Cluster the Scaler will detect it and trigger the creation of the node here in our favorite cloud provider or in our on-premise solution if we have that. And as a result, we're gonna have a third node joining the cluster that will occupy, uh, well, will allocate again the dummy pod. By the time we did all of this at Deliver Hero, uh, Kubernetes didn't have pod priority and preemption by default. It was a, a beta feature that you had to enable in Kubernetes API. We tricked a bit the Kubernetes API. We read the documentation and understood how to do this. 
And we created a Helm chart because we use a lot of Helm. I think it has become a deployment standard in the community and everywhere in every single company that I know. And we, of course, were using it. So we created a chart for everyone at the company to use it. And we made it public in our own Helm chart registry that is available in GitHub if you want to check it out here at Deliver Hero Helm Charts. And after that, we started benefiting because at that time when um, we were running usually more nodes than we needed just to make sure that our applications will never be impending and waiting for resources to be available. Uh, of course, as a hot fix and immediately solution, we added a few more nodes that we require on a daily basis. And after implementing this, we let again Cloud Photo Scaler to take uh, to take care of it and run as many nodes aware as were needed at any time. I'm going to show you a small demo. Uh, this is something I, I it's publicly available on YouTube. The video that I'm going to show because this is something some content that I created for our Deliver Heroes Tech um, blog post and also Tech channel in YouTube. And just for you to see how this actually works in Kubernetes, how you can see happening in Kubernetes. Uh, so here, as you can see, I uh, don't think I can make the, uh, maybe I can make this a bit bigger, that's full screen, there we go. We have two nodes running in a Kubernetes cluster. Oh, and Miguel, and, do you mind if I stop you for one second, just because we just got a question? Sure, yeah. Okay, um, this is from Ari. And he asked, so this solution is mostly for unexpected load increases, which a normal auto scaler is not prepared or too slow for? Uh, let's say no. It's basically to ensure that our applications will not never have to wait because every single auto scaler works the same way, which is uh, whenever a pod is unscalable, which is usually the case uh, when there's no enough CPU or memory in, on all of the nodes. Uh, we'll create a node and those nodes, depending on what solution we're using, if it's a cloud like AWS or Google Cloud, or if we're using on-premise, usually take a few minutes, like between two or five minutes to be created and join the cluster. And during that time, uh, we're going to have pods impending that can affect our, our traffic or can affect the way we serve our traffic. So the idea is there is some enough room available all of the time. So every time our applications, our important applications are uh, scaling up, uh, they will have enough space. And in the meantime that these new pods are created, a new node will be uh, also created and joined in the cluster. Okay, and just one other follow-up question, not from Marty, but from Sherry, is yeah. asking if you could maybe zoom in so she can see your font size better. Mm, I don't think so because it's, it's a video. In, yeah, but like you in, said, since it's in YouTube, perhaps we can share the link later in our Slack or on LinkedIn so that people can get a yeah. closer look. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah, we can definitely do that. Okay, good. So what I wanted to say is like this is, for example, following this is a two nodes cluster, and we're going to install the cluster with provisioner as well, an application, a to-do application here, just for testing purposes. So there's one pod running here and a few Nginx pods. Um, then we install the other Helm chart cluster of a provision, as we can see in the second screen of the one at the bottom. And after that, we're going to see here, we have three parts impending, three parts called cl cluster of a provision default, which is the name of the chart release. And they are going to create new nodes because as they, they all are impending, cluster of the scalar will find them as unescapable and then will trigger new nodes. If we keep on forwarding this a bit, this is the application. Yes, yes, as the demo shows. Um, new nodes are going to join the cluster as we are gonna see right here where the pods are now running, the cluster of provisioner pods are now running. And if we go a bit here, we can see that two new nodes, two, three new nodes are now um, have now joined the cluster, right? Which are 70, 79 seconds or 85 seconds uh, old. All right, so after that, we are uh, in, the, in the demo, I run a load test so we can uh, generate some fake traffic and cause the application, this demo application to scale up. And once has a scaling, scaling up, then I'm gonna advance it to here. We will see how, um, 
how two new pods have been created. And here at the, at the top uh, window, we see that now there are three pods called to do, and they all are running. Two of them are 22 seconds old, and we can see how on the other window at the downside, plus the provision and two of the pods are now impending. This means that these two pods were evicted. They gave the space they had for the to do application, and then um, it will cause cluster to scale to, to create new nodes. And if we forward a bit more, we can see now how two new nodes were created here, which are four second and five second old. And in this case, in the video, you will see how one more time um, a pod is evicted. Here we go, here it's impending, and a new to do application pod is now container creating. So this is exactly how this over provisioning works. Oh, and just so, one other question. Sorry, we got another question um, yep. from an anonymous person. How would this be different from Kubernetes auto scaling? Uh, because Kubernetes auto scaling does not understand the meaning of nodes or uh, any of that. For auto scaling, basically, it uh, depends on what you're using. If it's HPA or it's on top of auto scaling, you only understand the amount of CPU uh, being utilized across all the available pods and the target CPU to, to heat and create a new replica. Cluster Autoscaler only understand about pods which are impending, pods which are not scalable. And this is exactly the point where we need this over provisioning space to always have some room available for our important pods. So in the end, this is a, this is something else to add, something extra to do because there is no uh, native way in cluster auto scaling or any other auto scaling solution to understand the meaning of a node itself and an extra space, a spare resource. Perfect. So, yeah, this and all the topics will be covered in the book that we're writing, Kubernetes best practices. Um, I can also share another tip. Uh, another tech team here at Deliver Hero is using this exact uh, hunt, uh, hunt chart to run it as a daemon set. So they do something also quite tricky, which is, you know that pods usually get uh, an amount of CPU request and a different amount of CPU limit that is usually a bit higher than the amount of CPU requested, right? So whenever an application requires to take more CPU, it will um, use this CPU from, uh, from the limits and will not be a throttle. But of course, this can actually make some noise inside the node, inside the rest of the pods running in the same node and cause multiple pods in the same node to actually have CPU throttling happening. So what my other tech team did, or my colleagues from a different tech team here at Deliver Hero did, is to deploy this cluster of over scaling or cluster of provisioner deployment as a daemon set. So there's always a pod running with a bit of space, like a one core or a couple of cores, and they will not be used at all because as I mentioned, the application is just running a sleep command. So we'll never get into CPU and they allow this space to be used by another you know, pod that requires to go over the request and use the limits. So basically with this approach, they reduce the amount of CPU throttling that can happen across the different parts in the same node. Excellent. Now, um, uh, just a quick question is that, uh, can you just tell us, Miguel, how long you've been working in Delivery Hero? Uh, five years, almost. <laughs> okay, and so you've seen then the whole um, adaptation process, the introduction of Kubernetes into the company then? Uh, yes and no. When I started in my platform, Kubernetes was already used, okay. but not everyone in the, in the company. And as well, I was one of the few people having this knowledge or adopting uh, or learning this knowledge of Kubernetes in the company. I help other entities and other tech teams inside Delivery Hero to adopt it as well. Okay. Um, I just asked that just because a lot of times we encounter, you know, the whole debate, is my company ready for Kubernetes? Do we have the right business case? Does it make sense? I was just curious as to maybe how some of those conversations happen in Delivery Hero. And in addition, you know, since our community were very focused on data on Kubernetes, how those conversations might be happening in Delivery Hero or how they have happened of, do we want to run stateful uh, workloads in production? Do we want to run them on, on Kubernetes? How's that worked? So of course there was a lot of talk about when adopting uh, Kubernetes was the best approach for everyone at Delivery Hero, but in the end, the tech leaders decided that yes, that in, in the case of business we have 
makes a lot of sense to use Kubernetes because it helps us to be cost effective and use the amount of resources we need and also to grow um, very fast and, and also not paying too much attention to, to the amount of um, replicas and computing resources we needed. Uh, so yes, it was actually an easy conversation. And regarding stateful sets, that's a bit more tricky, right? Because uh, Deliver Here is a business that is growing very fast and we need to be very agile with every single technology and also how we evolve our platform. And we decided to, for security reasons, and also um, to focus the, in human resources on, on the growth of the business itself, to not run data on Kubernetes, stateful applications that require databases and data that cannot be ever be lost or compromised to not running on Kubernetes, and use a managed services instead. Traditional managed services, like in Amazon, you have RDS, and all of the data remains in a different place, completely safe and, and not having the risk of Kubernetes. Because of course, um, Kubernetes has some difficulties and there are some, there's some um, um, work required to ensure availability and also to not lose any data. And the company decided to invest the human resources uh, into a different scope. Mm -hmm. So once again, we see that different companies have different situations. As you mentioned, it could be for reasons of agility, uh, points of view regarding security, high availability um, of these kind of things. For, because for example, how many customers does Delivery Hero serve? Uh, worldwide, I, tell, I don't know the numbers, um, but we are going, we are making more than 5 million orders a day. Wow. Uh, so. Uh, worldwide. So you can kind of imagine how many users we must have every day on, on our platforms. And yeah, and then, then the amount of data that's being generated through all the different interactions that they have on the website, um, through the yeah. orders, the returns, the emails, the contact lists, all those different things. Exactly. Because we run on microservice architectures. So we have completely different pieces of code for different uh, tasks. And yeah. And that's also one of the reasons why running on Kubernetes made the most sense. Mm -hmm. And another question from our friend Ari. What do you personally think about running data on Kubernetes? When does it make sense? I think, I uh, guess, when you have enough human resources as to manage Kubernetes uh, safely and with the always um, um, a team enabled for it as well that has a, the, the, the skills and the time to focus on all, all of it. And also whenever you want to ensure data can be extended or massively, because I think one, that's exactly one of the main advantages of Kubernetes, how easy it is to extend the size of the clusters and how easy it is to integrate, no, no, well, not to integrate, but add more computing resources. So I would say if you're gonna run massive amount of load, it makes a lot of sense as long as you have a team prepared for it and that can invest the time into Kubernetes and their eight hours a day. <laughs> yeah, eight hours a day, as you said. So it's it's a question of sort of knowing the limits, the right scope, the right situation. Um, yeah. Very, very good. Now for a different question, uh, just because some folks arrived a little bit late, when will this book be available? Because I, yeah, I go can't, for it. I can't, I can't say that one. <laughs> okay, that's lots so, right. Okay, good. <laughs> so we are... We started uh, already um, writing a number of articles already, so we are um, in the in the works um, at the moment. There are a number of uh, stages after we finish the writing. Um, Miguel Angel, for instance, is uh, he is already uh, um, actually in the reviewing phase. Uh, but we have, um, you know, we have, it is a, a moving target, right? We have new people joining, new people uh, starting uh, working on multiple uh, articles. It's a very dynamic um, um, uh, atmosphere or, or environment where, you know, everyone is collaborating in whatever uh, article they want to, to work on. Mm -hmm. So it's it's very agile type of, uh, of work. And, you know, I would say before summer, uh, it should be ready. Now, it also may vary the way we uh, start uh, sharing this. Uh, ideally, it will be a book, but we know nowadays 
uh, printing books um, is not the most efficient and an easy way to to share. So we we might look also into other um, more uh, virtual ways of uh, sharing knowledge. Um, so I will definitely say before before um, summer, but it, it might be actually in, in just a, a couple of months. We'll see, but uh, definitely um, you know um, you know stay there uh, and if there is anyone that is interested to collaborate it's never it's never late right so there's uh, an ongoing project and um, which needs uh, to be updated uh, uh, quite often okay no it's very very good to know obviously we have the link right here um, and so that if anyone wants to get involved, we'll definitely be linking this in our Slack, in LinkedIn, and also in our newsletter as an invitation to people. Maybe some topics are already covered, but I'm assuming that this will be the first edition of hopefully many editions of best practices on Kubernetes. Um, so, and it's also just a great way to connect. And as you said, it's one thing to write articles, but when the real fun starts is when you have to edit things and quality control and, and, and all the things that go into that. And from what I understand as well is that the idea for this book is to be bilingual, um, to be in English and in Spanish, um, which is great for diversity inclusion. You get folks from other countries involved, obviously with the possibility of having things in more languages. All right, oh good, so Miguel put, oh, okay, wait, Miguel put the video in there too. Thank you, Miguel. Um, uh, no, it's good. Uh, I sent it to Sherry as well by Meetup. Just wanted to make sure that she got it. We'll also include the link um, when we when we send out our newsletter next week and also like I said on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, but I think it's a, I think it's a very, very good exercise. Um, and because how many people are working together on this book? So at the moment we are five um, authors uh, that are working on it. Uh, we have um, a number of people interested on reviewing those articles, which is another type of role that we are including in the team. Um, also people interested on translating, as you said, uh, this, uh, we are all um, Spanish speakers, but um, ideally we will, you know, translate that and, and, and share that in, in English, right? Just for inclusion, but also, you know, uh, reaching a, a bigger audience. So yeah, that, that, is, the, um, uh, that is the goal and um, yeah. Very, very good. Well, um, if you can, uh, let's see, if Miguel, if you can stop sharing your screen. Yep. Um, Gorka, can we? Yeah. As always, uh, we have a mystery guest who's in our crowd, who is Angel, who's also a Spanish speaker, lives in Vitoria Gastes. And in all of our meetups, he always likes to create a little visual summary of what our speakers have been talking about. Um, so Gorka, can we share, are we, can you see, can you see my screen? Yes. I think I love it. I want that in my email. <laughs> well, you got it. All right. So as Angel is super on point, as we say in Spanish, a detallista. Uh, pays very close attention to lots of different things that we may not realize we're talking about, but he does. Um, so while we're talking, we always exchange a couple of messages to give him some ideas. And, and this is what he came up with. So once again, we'll be putting this in social media, our newsletter, et cetera. I'll send it both to you today by email. Um, yeah, thank you so much for your time. This is a fantastic conversation, extremely practical. Great to see how knowledge can be directly applied very, very well explained. Um, Miguel Angel, if you ever want to be a teacher, I think you'll have a very easy time. Um, Thank you. No, because you make it really simple. It's very, very easy to follow. So if the book follows this logic, I think there's going to be a lot of resources that we'll be able to share with our community. Um, it's been very nice because other times we meet speakers through LinkedIn or, you know, contacting someone in a different country you don't even know. In this case, it came through sort of more natural, organic networking. Um, and so it was really, really nice that we were able to, to put this together. And I'm sure we'll be having you back on the program. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you I very must, much. Yeah, I must say thank you, uh, uh, Bart, for hosting us and letting us uh, publish a bit of the idea that we have and make it uh, aware everyone in the world that we are doing this as well. And we are um, happy to share our knowledge and contribute to community the way we can. Our pleasure, yes. absolutely. Thank you, Bart. Good. Looking forward to the next one. Yes. That being said, we do have another meetup today at 6 p.m. Central European time, 9, 9 a.m. California time. 
um, with uh, Jim Walker from Cockroach TV. He's going to tell us all about distributed databases. So today is a very intense day for our community. But I'm so glad that we finally got to do this because I think we started talking in probably November or maybe even October. Um, so anyway, yeah. it's going to be very exciting to see how things develop with the book. We will also definitely be giving away copies of the book to people in our community. Um, so you can get your hands on that and get all that wonderful knowledge that, uh, that the two of you are sharing with the other people in your team. And from what I understand as well, all the benefits, all the profits from the book will be going to um, uh, the CNCF. Is that correct? CNCF. Yeah, correct. Very, very mm -hmm. good. Um, uh, once again, a fantastic initiative to support. Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you for all the questions. Look forward to seeing you in Slack, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, all the other places where we are. If you want a t-shirt, give me your address. I'd be happy to send you one. Thanks a lot. Take care. Thank you very much. Have a nice Thank day. You. Thank bye you. Bye. 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 Bye.